I just want to take a minute to let you know, if you like This Is Monsters, you might like my other show, Somewhere Sinister. Each season, we go to a different place and tell sinister stories from that area. You can check it out by going to this link here. Thanks so much, and on to the story. When seasoned hiker Helen Torbett ventured out on one of her regular solitary treks through the Scottish Highlands and failed to return, her husband's alarm bells started ringing. Helen was no novice to these trails. In fact, she was a seasoned expert. Her latest trip was to a spot she had visited annually for the past six years, which made her disappearance even more baffling and disquieting. The Highlands, in all their wild, untamed beauty, could be treacherous, but Helen was never one to back down from a challenge. What she could have never prepared for was that a far graver threat lurked, not in the wilderness she loved, but alarmingly closer to home. This is Monsters. Helen Fiona Graham was born in Scotland in 1931. As a child, she was a talented musician and she loved the great outdoors, both passions which she would pursue for the rest of her life. In the late 1950s, Helen met Thomas Torbett, who was a gynecologist working in Glasgow's Southern General Hospital. On the side, Thomas worked as a district court magistrate while Helen earned her living as an instrumentalist and later as a writer. Helen was well known for her articles about the Scottish Highlands, which were regularly published in the Great Outdoors magazine. In their spare time, Thomas and Helen shared a love of sailing, and she was qualified as a yacht master. A love of the outdoors wasn't something Helen only enjoyed writing about. She was an incredibly experienced hiker who spent weeks every year traveling to remote trails and mountains for day or overnight hikes. In fact, Helen was so skilled and knowledgeable about the climb she undertook that she even made corrections to survey maps in the areas she hiked. She also co-wrote a book about Scottish Grahams, which is the name given to hills in Scotland that are between 609 meters and 762 meters high with a drop of more than 150 meters on all sides. This is equivalent to hills that are more than 2,000 feet and less than 2,500 feet. Before Helen wrote the book, the hills were called Marilyns, but due to some confusion between the names of different sized hills, Helen and her co-author began labeling them as Grahams in honor of her maiden name. Helen wrote the book as a guide to others who wished to climb one or more of the hundreds of Grahams just like she had been doing for years. After Helen and Thomas retired, and once their only son was grown and living his own life, she devoted herself to exploring more and more of the largely untouched Scottish countryside. What had once been a twice-a-year kind of thing became an almost full-time endeavor, and the expansive, rugged beauty of the Scottish Highlands became Helen's playground. She spent longer and longer periods away from home exploring new mountains and registering more Grahams onto the nationwide list. While she loved discovering new areas, there was something that drew Helen back to one place year after year. Wester Ross is an area located in the northwest highlands of Scotland along what is considered Scotland's version of Route 66. It offers a striking and diverse landscape of deep sea lochs, farmland, and white sandy beaches, all with quaint little villages dotting along the way. A loch is a Scottish Gaelic term for a lake or a sea inlet, and they are a defining feature of the Scottish landscape. While Helen was drawn to the Wester Ross region as a whole, it was one of those tiny villages that held her heart from the very first visit. Tucked away on the tranquil north shore of Loch Duick is the cozy little village of Inverinit. Inverinit has less than a dozen houses, and the majority of its residents are age 40 and above. It's the kind of place where everyone knows everyone, and their business. This secluded location and small-town charm make it an idyllic retreat for those seeking peace and solitude. For six years, Helen had been coming to Inverinit just for that. On her first trip, she had discovered the charming Grenin House, which quickly became her favorite bed and breakfast. The guest house was a modern bungalow set on extensive and well-maintained gardens. On one side was a road, and the other was a pebbled shore to the lock. 
Needless to say, the setting was picturesque. The accommodations were comfortable, and the homely and welcoming atmosphere was the perfect place for Helen to rest between hikes. Grandin House was run by Zena McMillan and her husband David with the help from their son Donald, who lived in a caravan next to the property. Helen often stayed at the bed and breakfast for a couple of weeks at a time, and Zena and Helen had become friends over the years. Since Helen had become a regular, Zena had come to know much more about the local area from her guests than she ever had from people who actually lived in the region. When Helen stayed at Grandin House, her routine was predictable. She would get up in the early hours before the other guests and head off to the hills for the whole day. Most days, she wouldn't get back to the guest house until between 6 and 8 o'clock at night. Then she would have a shower, get into her nightdress, and sit in one of the warm lounges writing about her day in her personal diary. It was this predictability that first indicated something was wrong on Wednesday, July 7, 1993. While Helen was in and Varen had exploring the Grams, Thomas had gone on a sailing trip. Thomas didn't enjoy the mountains in the same way Helen did. He preferred the high seas, and while Helen had once been a keen sailor, recent health issues meant she wasn't as confident on a boat anymore. So Helen and Thomas harmoniously agreed that they would pursue their passions separately, but at the same time. They would plan their solo trips on the same date so that they weren't away from each other any longer than they needed to be. They kept in touch regularly using a telephone and were never out of contact for more than three or four days at a time. But on this particular occasion, the timing of their simultaneous trips wasn't perfect and Thomas was due back home before Helen. So they agreed that on the day Thomas got back, she would drive the four-hour trip to their home in Busby. She would spend a night or two at home and then return to Inverinit to complete her planned hikes. So when Thomas got home that night, he expected Helen would be waiting for him. But as the afternoon turned into evening and then night, she never showed. It was extremely out of character for her to not call and tell him that she had changed her plans. Thomas had tried the guest house multiple times, but there was no answer there either. It turned out that around the time when Helen was due to return home for a couple of nights, Zena had received news that her brother was seriously ill. He lived four hours away in Aberdeen and Zena had left immediately to be at his side. She left her son Donald in charge of the guest house with help from his cousin William and his wife Susanna who also lived in caravans on the property. Thomas was immediately worried that something had gone wrong on Helen's hike and that she might be injured in a remote forest somewhere. By the second night of her not showing up at home and there being no answer at the guest house, he reported her missing to the police. Given that the guest house was the last place Helen was known to have been, it was the natural place to start looking for her. The police arrived on Thursday morning, not long after Zena had arrived back from her trip to see her unwell brother. Donald told her that Helen had left the previous day, and he said that Helen had paid cash. Zena thought that was unusual, given that Helen had always paid by check in the past, but she thought no more of it until the police arrived. When they were told that Helen had been reported missing, both Zena and David were taken by surprise. Donald repeated what he had told his mother just moments before, and they both offered to do whatever they could to help. After discussing what they could remember about Helen over the past few days, the pair showed officers to her room. While officers looked around the bed and breakfast, a massive ground search got underway. Three mountain rescue teams, along with countless volunteers, fanned out into the various trails which led up to the mountains. They all knew that when Helen was visiting in Varanit, she would only ever walk for the day, never overnight. With that in mind, there was only so far she could physically have walked, and the prospect of finding her on one of those trails was good. At the same time, the Royal Navy and a team of police divers were called in to search the lock just in case she had made her way into the water. A helicopter also went up to take aerial photographs of places that ground searchers might not be able to reach. Meanwhile, back at the bed and breakfast, officers made a surprising discovery. When Zena unlocked the door to Helen's room, they found it completely empty. All of her things were gone. Her bag, her toiletries, all of her personal belongings, gone. It was as if Helen had packed up and left. Yes, she was planning to go back and visit her husband, but she was due to come back within a couple of days and she had her room at the guest house booked for another week. There was no reason why she would need to take all of her things for an overnight trip home. And there was something else. 
Helen's Volkswagen Golf was still parked right outside the front door. So if she had gone for a walk and gotten lost or hurt, where were all of her things? And if she had packed her bags and gone home to see her husband, how exactly had she gotten there without taking her car? It was only when officers asked Donald directly whether he had seen anything out of the ordinary that they considered there might be a third option. Donald told the officers that the night before Helen went missing, she had taken a phone call at the guest house. A few hours later, Helen told him that she was leaving to start a new life, but that she would come back in a couple of days to collect her vehicle. That's when she had handed him the cash for her stay. He had then watched as she took her bags and got into a vehicle with a man he didn't recognize. Taking a ride with a stranger was completely out of character for Helen, but maybe the man wasn't a stranger to her. Leaving in someone else's car did explain why all of her belongings were missing from her room and why she wasn't on any of the trails where searchers had expected to find her. It also provided a reasonable answer for why her car was still parked outside of the guest house. Donald's statement was the first major break in the case. Within an hour, the investigation turned away from the Highlands and all efforts were directed to identify the mystery vehicle and its driver. Officers spoke to Donald again and they were given more precise information about the make and model of the vehicle he had seen Helen get into. He described it as a dark-colored sedan or station wagon. Because it was dark, Donald hadn't been able to make out any defining features of the man who was driving the vehicle. Meanwhile, Thomas made a number of public appeals on local and national news broadcasts where he begged for any information about Helen's disappearance. By then, he was aware of the rumors about his wife running off with another man. In his statements, he asked her to contact him in confidence just so he knew she was okay. If she wanted to leave, he would respect her decision. He just wanted to know that she was safe. At the same time, officers were combing over Helen's vehicle to see if it could provide any further information about where she had gone. Inside the car, they found her walking stick, which she used whenever she hiked. Thomas was adamant that she would have never gone on a hike without it. It was looking more and more like Helen wasn't going to be found in the mountains. With so little to go on, it wasn't long before the investigation stalled completely. By then, most people seemed to believe that Helen had simply grown tired of her life and she used the cover of one of her regular hiking trips to plan her escape. Why she felt she needed to be secretive about the decision was anyone's guess, but the general feeling was that the mystery man was her new lover and she simply didn't want to be found. When people disappear, attention naturally turns to those closest to the victim. In this case, that person was Thomas. He was forced to reiterate that Helen would never just run away and that they had a long and happy marriage. He claimed that there was more to her disappearance than people believed and he continued to appeal for information. During the course of the investigation, officers spoke to friends and neighbors of the couple. Not one of them could think of any reason why Helen would want to leave. However, the speculation about Helen's supposed secret life or terrible marriage was reignited when Thomas put their family home up for sale just a couple of months after she went missing. For gossipers, the sale of the family home was confirmation that the marriage was not as perfect as Thomas had claimed and Helen had disappeared to get away from her husband. But the police weren't so sure. In the months since Helen went missing, there had been no withdrawals from her account and no activity on any of her cards. Her passport hadn't been used, close friends who would have expected Helen to reach out hadn't heard from her and she had never come back to collect her vehicle. Even if she had run away, she had left no trace as to where her new life had taken her. With no new leads, the police repeatedly went back to the guest house to speak to Donald to see if he recalled anything new that might help them. But his story was always the same and over time he became less and less interested in speaking to authorities. In fact, they spoke to Donald so many times that he complained to the press that he was being harassed by the police. Zena was present for most of his interviews, but on one occasion while she was on holiday, he commented, quote, It's lucky I have an alibi. It was an odd comment because Donald didn't actually have an alibi for that night. There were no other guests at the bed and breakfast on the date Helen went missing. And because Helen was the only guest there, Donald's cousin and his wife who lived on the property had no reason to come up to the main house. So no one had actually seen Donald or Helen that day. But while his comment was weird and inaccurate, it didn't specifically indicate anything that required a closer look. 
Meanwhile, the physical search for Helen continued, and volunteers continued to scour the area around Inverinit. A number of sightings of Helen were reported in the surrounding towns, but all of the tips turned out to be dead ends. As days turned into weeks and then months, hope faded that there would ever be an answer as to what had happened to Helen in the highlands of Scotland. The answer to the mystery seemed as elusive as Loch Ness's famed monster. Ten months after Helen's disappearance, the hunt to locate her had consumed over 400 hours of manpower. It was the most extensive search ever undertaken in Highland Police history, and yet it had proved fruitless. There was neither a comforting signal that she was safe, starting afresh somewhere new, nor a distressing sign that she had met an unfortunate fate amidst the unforgiving crags and ravines of the Scottish Highlands. All that her family and friends had were unanswered questions, but that would all change in early 1994. As winter turned into spring in Scotland, the melting snow revealed more than just the beauties of the local flora. Muriel Mackenzie was visiting in Veronet when she took a walk along the main highway towards town. As she walked, she noticed something shiny reflecting in the underbrush below a bank of willow trees on the side of the pathway. She reached in to see what the shiny items were and pulled out a couple of black trash bags. One of those trash liners contained a handbag, and inside that bag was a purse and bank cards with the name Helen Torbett. Muriel wasn't a local, and therefore she wasn't familiar with the significance of the name, but a local forestry worker she flagged down was. He notified the police of the discovery, and the bag was examined later that day. Along with the purse and bank cards, the bag also contained a smaller hill-walking bag and a single slipper. Helen would never have gone into the mountains without her hill-walking bag, and it's unlikely that she would have discarded her handbag if she had taken off with another man. The discovery of Helen's handbag breathed new life into the case, and it also marked a turning point. It was beginning to look more like Helen wasn't a missing person. She was likely a murder victim. But there was something else significant about the discovery of Helen's handbag. The copse of willow trees where it was found was just 200 yards away from the Grannon guest house. Someone there knew something they weren't telling. But who? With an idea of who the potential murderer might be, but with nothing definitive to go on, a warrant was issued to search the entire guest house. Maybe investigators were hoping to find blood spattered all over the walls or something obvious to indicate they had found a murder scene. Instead, they found an extensively redecorated and recarpeted guest house. It didn't look anything like the photos they had taken when they looked through the property when Helen had first gone missing all those months ago. After 12 hours of searching, they had found nothing to indicate anything untoward had happened there. Investigators had looked up chimney flues, pulled back carpet, and inspected hidden corners of the shadowy attic, all with nothing to show for it. But when the search moved to the final shower room on the other level of the guest house, their luck changed. In a cupboard that hadn't been recarpeted, they found a loose section of floorboards. When they pulled the boards back, they found a bag with Helen's name printed on the handle. It was an overnight bag, the same one she had supposedly been carrying when she got into a car the night she went missing. Lying next to it was a plastic bag stuffed with various personal items and a slipper which matched the one found in her handbag. When the overnight bag was taken back to the station for examination, investigators found a single clue which would turn the case on its head. Inside the bag was Helen's personal journal, the same one she wrote in every night. Helen had been keeping a meticulous journal for the last 50 years, ever since she was a teenager. In it, she detailed her daily experiences with a particular focus on documenting everything she observed on her walks, from the bird life to the name of the various flora and fauna. Her journal was a beautiful window into Helen's mind, and there on the page was her final entry, written the night before she was last seen. She had written, quote, Strange letter from Donald McMillan. Embarrassing to cope with. Donald McMillan Jr. was always known as a bit of a strange guy. He had a ponytail, and he lived in a caravan on his parents' property. That might not seem too far removed from lots of folks these days, but in the relatively conservative Scottish Highlands, his lifestyle was considered odd. Donald had once served in the military as a tank driver, but he had been discharged after serving six months in military prison for going absent without leave. 
Ever since he had returned from the service, he had lived in the caravan at the back of his parents' bed and breakfast. They didn't necessarily need the help, and they tried to encourage Donald to get a real job, but he never lasted more than a couple of months, and he would soon be back needing their financial support again. But that wasn't what made the locals, in particular women, think he was a weirdo. Rumors in the town were that Donald was a stalker and a peeping Tom. Multiple women said they thought they had seen Donald looking through their curtains at night. Others said he wrote them letters and gave them gifts of perfume which had belonged to his mother. No one had ever reported Donald to the police and he had never been caught peeping, but still, the local women were wary of him. With the discovery of the journal and the fact that Donald was the last person to have seen Helen, it seemed highly likely that he had some information about why her bag was found under the floorboards at the guest house. On the same day the bag was found, Donald was brought into the station for questioning under suspicion of murder. At the same time, officers searched Donald's caravan. Inside, they found various pairs of women's underwear and stacks of pornographic magazines. Inside the pages, the women in the pictures had strange markings with various numbers written on them. The youngest women in the pictures had lower numbers and the women who appeared to be older had numbers as high as 400. What they had just discovered was Donald's own personal rating system. The higher, the better. See, Donald liked older women, so much so that he admitted he was obsessed with them. He clearly had some mommy issues, but at least it's a nice change from the child-loving psychos I tend to talk about. During questioning, David stuck to the same story he had repeated numerous times before. He had seen Helen leave, she had told him she was going to start a new life, she paid in cash and said she was going to come back for her car. Once again, he claimed that the police were harassing him and that he had nothing to do with Helen going missing. And he repeated his comment about having an alibi. But during his interview, Donald did confess to one thing. When he was confronted about the stacks of porn from his caravan, he admitted that he was the peeping Tom that women in the town whispered about. He claimed that he only bothered if the woman was older. He had no time for the young ones. On top of that, Donald liked to steal women's underwear from their washing lines. But he didn't just hide it in his drawer and pull it out on special occasions. No, Donald would wear the lingerie underneath his clothing during the day. Apart from the rumors about Donald's creepy stalking, no one knew what he really got up to in his spare time. If they had, they would have been more than just creeped out. By the time Donald made that confession, the investigators were convinced that he knew more than he was letting on about Helen's disappearance. But no matter what they said, Donald refused to admit to anything else. Investigators had always suspected there was more to be found on the land around the guest house, but with Donald keeping quiet, they had to come up with other ways to search the area. But where to start? Given the rugged terrain on one side of the property and a deep lock on the other, Helen could be anywhere. By then, investigators were convinced there wasn't going to be a positive outcome. They knew they were looking for a body. If Donald had taken Helen's body up into the dense forest, there was little hope of finding her. There simply wouldn't be enough manpower to make a thorough search of the area, and if she had been dumped into the lock, she would likely never be found. It was too deep, too dark, and too cold to thoroughly search. Plus, ten months of moving currents would likely have moved her from wherever she had been left. While the prospect of finding Helen after all that time was slim to none, investigators weren't prepared to give up yet. They brought in high-tech radar equipment to scan for abnormalities beneath the surface of the soil, and they sent yet another helicopter up to take photos of the area from above. The septic tank at the guest house was also examined. After another week of searching, there was still no sign of Helen. Meanwhile, the ongoing police presence on their land as well as the intense media coverage was taking a toll on Donald's parents. They had initially defended their son and had even joined him in calling out police harassment, but as the weeks wore on they were beginning to realize that it was likely he could have been involved in Helen's disappearance. Finally, after much encouragement, they agreed to go and speak to Donald in jail to see if they could get him to admit what he knew. The day after Donald's mother and father visited him in jail, he drew a simple diagram of the bed and breakfast. On the map, he marked a spot a few yards away from the back door. He told the investigators that under a pile of logs and metal and a thin layer of dirt, they would find what they were looking for. 
The next day, a forensic tent was set up over the area, and layer by layer, scoop by scoop, the soil was removed and put through a sieve. Under less than 12 inches of dirt, they found the decomposed remains of Helen Fiona Torbett. She was wrapped up in bandages like a mummy, and her hands and legs were tied together. Her mouth was also covered with packing tape. She was still wearing the nightdress she usually slept in, which had been cut up the middle. Her killer had obviously tried to rape Helen before taking her life. Despite the decomposition, the medical examiner was able to determine that her cause of death was manual asphyxiation by smothering. She had suffered seven fractures to her ribs and several blows to her head and body. The medical examiner concluded that Helen had her hands tied behind her back and was put into a face-down position with a gag in her mouth. Her killer had then knelt on her back and had her face down into a pillow. She would have lost consciousness after two minutes and died between four and six minutes later. After the discovery of Helen's body, Donald was immediately charged with her murder. For the first time, his story changed and he admitted that he had been the one to kill Helen, but he claimed that it was all a mistake. She had gotten angry at him for no reason. When he had tried to calm her down, he had accidentally killed her. You know, he accidentally pushed her face into a pillow for at least six minutes. An accident. In a strange twist, when the property had been photographed by a helicopter in the weeks after Helen first went missing, a picture was taken of Donald standing in the garden besides a pile of logs. Investigators wouldn't realize until later that he was standing on top of the body of his victim, right underneath their noses. In September of 1994, more than a year after Helen's murder, Donald's murder trial got underway. In court, Donald stuck to his story that he had accidentally murdered Helen after they had an argument, except this time he blamed the fight on Helen. He claimed that she had made advances on him. When he rejected her, she had tried to hit him and he put a pillow over her face to try to calm her down. Let me give you a tip for being in an argument with a woman. Putting a pillow over her face in an attempt to calm her down will never be successful. That action does not calm anybody down. Donald claimed that he had accidentally held the pillow there for at least five minutes and then he realized she was dead. He must have then accidentally bound her hands, gagged her, and then cut her nightgown too. He then claimed that he had covered up her death because he was afraid of what would happen to him. After the confession, his defense team offered that Donald would plead guilty to culpable homicide in exchange for a reduced sentence. The proposal was rejected by the prosecution. Donald's mother, Zena, testified for the prosecution during the trial. She told the court that she often left David in charge of the guest house when she had to go out of town and there had never been a problem before. Despite Donald saying that he was worried about getting in trouble and that's why he covered up Helen's death, Zena testified that when she came back from visiting her sick brother, Donald seemed completely normal. He didn't appear stressed or worried, and he calmly told her about Helen checking out and paying cash. The only unusual thing she had noticed was when the police came to search the grounds of the guest house immediately after Helen went missing. During those initial searches, she had observed that Donald would become agitated. She believed it was due to him feeling like the family were being harassed and that the presence of the police was bad for business. The anger towards the authorities only got worse when they came back and did a more thorough search four months later. During that search, she had seen a police officer holding her son up against the wall in a threatening manner and she believed that their treatment was unfair. While there was no DNA evidence given during the trial, forensic investigators were able to use liquid nitrogen to lift fingerprints from the tape that was used to bind Helen. Those fingerprints matched Donald's. Donald's parents had only come to recognize their son's involvement when Helen's bag was found under their floorboards. The moment they were told about the fingerprint evidence on the tape, they knew that their son was a killer. On the other side of the case, the prosecution argued that there was no evidence to indicate that Helen's murder was anything other than a sexually motivated attack. They told the court that Donald had propositioned Helen, likely with the letter she referred to in her journal. Helen was a married woman, and this proposition from a much younger man who was the son of one of her friends would have made her deeply uncomfortable. When she rejected his advances, Donald reacted violently. He tried to rape her, and during the altercation, he strangled her. 
It's not known at which point he restrained Helen or when he used the packing tape to cover her mouth, but we do know that it can take around five minutes for a person to die from asphyxiation, which removes any defense that a person could suffocate someone accidentally. Investigators believe Donald concealed Helen's body in the days after the murder because the area where she was buried was undisturbed during the first few searches of the property. Donald never revealed where or how he hid her body before he buried it under the pile of logs. The letter Helen referred to in her journal was never found. When Donald was asked what the letter was about, he downplayed it. He claimed that Helen had invited him to climb a nearby mountain called the Five Sisters of Kintail. He explained, quote, I said I would like to try and wrote her a note taking up her offer. It was more of a note than a letter, and I put it on her tray when I took her a cup of tea. There was nothing threatening or offensive in it. The prosecution's closing statement was, quote, I ask you to find that this attack was with intent to rape Mrs. Torbett. It was a prolonged attack on a friendly and trusting lady who he bound and gagged for sexual gratification. An attack by a callous man who showed no remorse whatsoever. It was not the case that something went tragically wrong in an argument. This was murder. The jury took just one hour to deliberate on the case. They agreed with the prosecution and Donald was found guilty of murder. Thomas was advised to stay away from the trial given the gruesome nature of the evidence which would be presented about his wife's final moments. Unlike many family members of murder victims, Thomas chose to heed the advice and he didn't attend the trial. The media took that as a sign that his perfect marriage had been anything but. Even though it was clear that Helen had been murdered and that she hadn't run off with a lover like they had printed so many times while she was missing. They took it a step further when throughout the trial, the media took it upon themselves to inform Thomas of every sore detail of what was done to Helen. Reporters would take what they had heard in court and then rush over to Thomas's house where they would bang on his door and tell him what had been said. Then they would ask him for his comment, which they would print in the next day's tabloids. If he didn't answer the door or refused to give a comment, they would twist the response to suit their own narrative. That Thomas was happy to be without Helen and he had easily moved on from her death. They can join Donald as co-monsters on this one. Ultimately, Donald was sentenced to life in prison. However, in 2003, a new sentencing law was passed which was intended to transition the system away from life sentences to minimum terms of imprisonment. Lawmakers believed the change was necessary from a human rights perspective. As soon as that law was passed, Donald appealed his sentence and he was given a new hearing. Again, he argued that Helen's death had been an accident and thankfully, again, the judge determined that her murder was anything but accidental. The judge commented, quote, it was a sexually motivated assault and you must have subjected the victim to a terrifying ordeal. He set Donald's minimum term of imprisonment at 15 years. While in jail, Donald became somewhat of a professional informant and he snitched on a number of other prisoners. While that seemed to please people on the outside, on the inside it was a different story. If you've ever heard the saying, snitches get stitches, well, that's what Donald lined himself up for. In early 2007, he found out he was going to be transferred from Sockton Prison to Schatz Prison. It turned out that his new prison was also home to a number of inmates who he had snitched on. It didn't take him long to realize that the new prison might not be the safest place for him and he told his family that he was scared for his life. On February 12, 2007, Donald was found dead in his cell. It was determined that he had died of a heart attack, maybe frightened to death. The shame of what Donald had done meant his family were forced to leave in Varanid after the trial. The guest house was sold and continues to operate today. He may be dead, but the charming Scottish Highlands will forever bear the scar of Donald's monstrous deeds. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harm yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. 
They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.